I'm sitting with my good friend and distinguished violin professor and wonderful violinist, Aaron Boyd. Welcome, Aaron, to our home. So delighted that we're finally making a collaboration that's official, although not probably the way we wanted to because this is unfortunately all virtual, but I do have hopes that we will play again in front of a, a ravishing crowd. I know that. Live people as opposed to virtual people. Um, it, it's, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you, um, and I've admired you for, for a very long time. So I guess the first question is, what, um, well, first of all, did you think that you would ever end up for a long time in North Texas for making your home here? I didn't count on it, but I certainly wanted it. I see. <laughs> I, uh, I, I came, first came to Dallas um, as a member of the Escher Quartet, and we gave some classes at SMU. And I immediately loved the place, loved Texas. I actually always loved the idea of Texas. My uncle lived here 50 years ago. Wow. And so to uh, have been able to apply for the position, but then chosen for that position was a great happiness to see my life. Wonderful. And now you'll get to know the Fort Worth audience, which may be not That's as right. familiar. Um, but in this concert where we play with people we've already worked with, such as Alan Steele, it, it should be a fantastic thing. And what we're trying to do, of course, is um, as every chamber music group seems to have done, uh, we want to keep everyone engaged. Yes. We want to let people know that we love making music, of course. Um, and it is a very strange way of doing it because an inherent part to making music is the audience. Yes. Um, so what would you say, um, since COVID, I would say, um, you've done some reporting, obviously a lot for the Chamber Music Society and the Center. Um, what would you say is the main adjustment you to make when you do a reporting like that, both as an interview and as a player and as somebody who, you know, is really used to collaborating with a lot of people and not able to do that right now. The danger with recordings and uh, not this interview, but some interview situations is that it can uh, both musically and uh, socially feel stilted sometimes. Mm -hmm. So one has to be very, uh, especially careful about maintaining natural uh, connection and natural communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, one also can miss that connection and that edit very special energy that comes from a live audience. And I think that that special energy is also palpable in recordings of live events where there's an audience that's almost a, 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 you know, a third partner, say there's two of us we're playing with, I guess it's sort of third part of that collaboration. And so I miss that. And yet I will say that the, that the COVID lockdown and the isolation has been very good for my Bach. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've made a collection of silver linings to this experience and one of the great silver linings is I was convinced that on any cert any certain day in April or May there was more solo Bach being played in the world and more on a single day than any other time in human history. I agree it was funny that most of my cellist friends have said they've now gone through the entire six suites as every other cellist. <laughs> yes, yes. For, for a little while I, I made a habit of starting every morning by playing the complete cycle Oh, really? Why? It's about, with repeats, about two and a half hours. No. <laughs> that, you know, it's funny because that's the, that's truly the cleansing of the soul. Yes, it is. Um, and I'm going to start doing that because I, really, I never really thought of that. You'll be, you'll be tired at the end. Oh, I, well, it's, the Chacon takes so much out of me. I think I may have to take a lunch break right there. <laughs> um, well, speaking of cleansing of the soul, um, what, what can you tell us uh, about your path, let's say, to the Escher Quartet and your path in chamber music? Because most of our patrons really love the background and of course so do I. I would say that uh, because of a couple of things. First of all, I had a great, great teacher in Pittsburgh who was Eugene Phillips, who's the father of Daniel and Todd Phillips with the Orion Quartet. And spiritually and culturally, he was just a force to be reckoned with in, in terms of his passion for the string quartet as the pinnacle of human and musical achievement and experience. Mm -hmm. And so I was marinated in that idea and that value from the age of about 11. So that when I came to study at Juilliard, I already knew very seriously that I wanted to play in the string quartet. I, of course, I had no idea how challenging a life that is. But I, when I was 18, 19, 20, it's something I couldn't possibly have imagined a more romantic lifestyle than playing Beethoven quartets and traveling the world doing so. Uh, so that I did actually have a concertmaster position in Arizona for a little while, so I did enjoy and love the orchestral experience. But when I had left that job, I left and came back to New York, I was approached by the Escher Quartet and asked to audition, and which I did somewhat reluctantly because I didn't think that's what I was going to do. And they invited me, and I joined, and that's how I ended up practically making a living. 
No, wonderful. How many years did you spend with the quartet? Five seasons. Five seasons. So it's very interesting because the old quartets, which I know we both admire, you know, the appointments were 30, 40, 50 years, you yes. know, and then you look at the Juilliard School Quartet, yep. I mean, it's just unbelievable, but it seems like the trend now is maybe somewhat shorter residencies, which doesn't, in my opinion, in any way compromise the qualities because you see people coming in and out, and usually the great quartets are still great. I would say that the, uh, so when you mentioned the Juilliard Quartet, there was only one member, uh, Robert Mann, who was there all 50, uh, all, for, for 50 years. Right. Uh, and the Budapest Quartet had a huge number of changes. There are only two quartets that I'm aware of that had really long-term, unchanging uh, membership, and that was the, the Great Amadeus Quartet and the Great and almost same era Don Mayer Quartet. Of course. Well, I was thinking of the premier only because they were Schmoyle. Yes, right. Yeah. So there's there's some the, the people for the people who really cut out for it, boy, they do live. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's well, of course, we all know the movie, the Warner Airy movie, which is just yes. it's such a hilarious thing, except yes. I love showing it to people who don't know that it's a gag. Right. Because, right. oh my God, these people really hate each yeah. other. <laughs> he says, yes, they do, but they really love making music together. Yeah, I, if you if you truly hate your colleagues, you're not going to make it that far. No. But it, it, I, I mean, I talk to them all individually, and, and the daily especially, you know, you by the day. <laughs> but I remember is, is, is that Michael Tree used to say, you know, daily has said, Exactly 18 words a season, <laughs> <laughs> but he does all of his talking with a fiddle. He does, you know, and it's just fantastic. And I would say that John Valley is pretty much one of the greatest uh, violinists. Yeah, He's probably still alive. He's a total natural. Yeah, he like Kim Tian. Yeah, he just yeah. always was. Yep. So one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is hearing your Slavonic dance. It's, it's oh, kind yeah. of my fault <laughs> because I made you do it. That's happy. But it's a four four hand piano piece, um, and on the series we. Had to avoid any kind of arrangements. The reason I, I went for this is this is an original arrangement. Yes, it's an arrangement that, that not only works beautifully for the strings, but it's something that Dvorak really approves. Yes. Do you approach that kind of music to say differently than a Chrysler arrangement of another composer? Um, what's what's your feeling on this? And that actually have a follow up on, on the Dvorak. Well, well, I will say first of all that I I adore Dvorak and his chamber music more highly than almost any other composer for. Chamber Ensemble. I just love his music. The thing that we were working on um, the other day, well actually yesterday, um, we should talk about Dvorak. It's so fascinating that Simrock was obviously the publisher for him and Brahms, and Brahms made it happen. Yes. And yet how many mistakes are there in Dvorak manuscripts? Well at least what, what we get mm -hmm. now, the critical editions as far as I'm concerned have had diff different mistakes, not really cleaned up the way they claim. Um, and, and so oftentimes you end up spending a lot of rehearsal time on wondering what is authentic, what makes sense, what is shorthand. So any yes. secrets on how to do that? Uh, I, I, the Dvorak that I play, and the, 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 between the quartets, which I adore, and the piano quintet, Bodenblen, and the piano quartet, which I love, and this stuff, I think it's been, it's so uh, deeply a part of the performance practice now, that most of that stuff, at least in my parts, has been cleaned up. And even when someone plays from, from a condition they have mistakes, by this time I know how it goes. Right. And so I can say, no, that's an A-flat, no, that's a no, that's a natural. Uh, so a lot of it just comes from, I mean, having played these pieces now hundreds of times, I, I'm pretty confident about uh, So in a, in a way, it's really performance practice. So exactly. That's what we're doing. Yes. You know, because performance tradition, I should say. Right, because I, I, I see, I mean, certainly on the orchestra side, you, you know, every couple of years there's yet another edition. Yeah. And that edition comes with scholarship over here, which of course I love. Yeah. And then we go back and we go, uh huh. So you fix this one, but these six yeah, are exactly. right. You know, I, 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 I don't <laughs> always, I don't, sometimes I prefer the old technology. I prefer yeah. the old, sometimes I will admit, I prefer first editions that have their own unique problems and solutions because, uh, it could be as, as lazy an option as this one, as what it used to be. I, I think it's actually better because you, now you're using your head and you're using your brain and most importantly, you're using your experience. Right. Um, oftentimes, you know, many of the scholars, and I don't think I'm insulting anyone, they're not master players and they have not no. performed this in 75 different no. times on five continents. And they have not met certain people in Vienna and in Budapest and in uh, Korea and in Hong Kong because I mean, I remember a couple of things that when, when one of my teachers said, well, I've got this thing on the Brahms A major sonata because my teacher was a teacher of Liszt and he played it with me. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I said, I mean, that's good enough for me. <laughs> that's good enough for you. Know? <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 I, I think the beauty of, of what we have now is we have access to different things. Oh, yes. And we are able to kind of sculpt a 360-degree image of what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm really excited to play with this quintet and certainly modern. Um, now, let's talk about acoustics for a second. You haven't played the modern yet. I've not played the modern. Okay. The modern is a very interesting auditorium. Um, and what I'm about to say, I think, is actually a positive. Okay. It's one of the very few halls that sounds the same empty as oh. it does with people. Yes. And I think that's actually a positive for what we're going to be doing on September 12th for the simple reason that one of the issues, maybe you can comment on this, when you rehearse at the Kulturgebouw, yes. when you rehearse at a large hall, let's say in St. Petersburg or, or even Carnegie, um, if you play in the main hall, you know, it's 2,700 seats, and that's really hard to yes. do when it's empty. And yes. 2,700 people show up, I go, that's not what I'm used to. 2,700 absorbing entities show up, yeah. sound absorbing bodies show up. So, so how do you treat the, the acoustical rehearsal? I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, after, and it's, it, 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 I hope that you believe me, uh, after touring for multiple years and playing many, many halls, I stopped listening. Uh -huh. Because um, I, I, the good halls are so rare. I got used to, I got used to playing in many, many bad halls. Interesting. That the danger for a hall which is not great is that you start to overplay to make some resonance and then you just end up killing your sound. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's probably an objective uh, entity in me that uh, says, ah, no, 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 don't push this or raise that, lower that. But for the most part, I stopped largely paying attention to hall acoustics because they were generally so unsatisfactory. But when the on the other end of that is that when it's a very good hall, it's like uh, it's like a day at the spa. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, the only thing where, where I, I do I think maybe I do listen to it a little bit more because I don't play quartets anymore. You know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> I we, we before. Yeah. I remember that. It's, I agree with you. But I, I think in some ways where I draw the line is when it's a very loud hall. Yes. Because when it's really loud, you have to take more time. Oh, there's no question. No, I think I, I should I should be more careful because. Uh, we, we do make some automatic adjustments. Right. You, don't make you just think, oh, I can't hear you, you've got to slow down, you've got to articulate more, those sort of things. That's just pure uh, professional craft. Right. Well, it's interesting because we should talk about students because, uh, you know, we both teach. And one of the things that I always encourage, especially at summer music festivals when I work with other people's students, is I try to get them into an acoustical Absolutely. atmosphere all the time. We're lucky with the Joby Dingles Festival that, that we have this wonderful auditorium. Yes. It's actually a chapel. Um, and I've actually made my fiddle students just go in there, whether they're ready or not, and go play Bach. Absolutely. And why? Because of chord breaks. Make them yes. listen to the chord break. How long will your middle voice sound? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I love well, yeah. I'm sorry, that doesn't really work in, in, a, in a room that's four by six, but it works really well in a chapel because if that sound has come back to you and then all of a sudden the timing's right. It's true because kids spend, I mean, young kids do not have the experience at the hall. They spend the bulk, I mean, 98% of their time practicing in a small, which is a small, tiny room. It's, you know, four by four cubicle. And so the slightest amount of work it's a, it produces a deafening amount of sound. Right. So they play small as a consequence. And so I agree with you. It's really important to get kids into a larger space to not to make the tone and to extend it. Yeah, and especially I think of the the better, not better, the more famous you know, conservatories such as like Jordan Hall and mm -hmm. yes. uh, NAC. I mean, yes. if you're looking at some of the older conservatories, uh, CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, is one. You know, they do have that incredible yeah. luxury where this is an acoustical space yeah. where. Where you can really listen. What can you tell us? Um, obviously, you were growing up with maybe Mazel as as Mazel was the music director when I was growing up at Pittsburgh. And any any uh, memorable concerts? I'm sure all of them. I'm a big fan of. It's funny. I my first job was as an usher mm. at the Pittsburgh Symphony at Heinz Hall in Pittsburgh because I wanted to hear concerts as much as possible, and that's where I saw our dear friend Mr. Cardenas a great deal. He, that's how he became the. The, the first model of a great concert master in my life because mm -hmm. he's the one I fixated on it and, and studied. And I remember his beautiful sonata solos. I remember earlier than that though, being eight years old, nine years old, and going to concerts in the nosebleeds. Yeah. Uh, with my with a jacket and my, with my mother and seeing Isaac Stern play the Beethoven concertos and, and always falling asleep, not because I was bored, but because 
is warm and distant and it's afternoon and right. there's nothing nicer than falling asleep when you're, <laughs> young, when you're a young child falling asleep at a concert. I love that. Uh, but I heard some really some really special things. I mostly remember Mazel's um, uh, Malva II, which was his farewell concert, which mm -hmm. was like two years ago. But Mazel was a local a genius. Mm -hmm. He grew up in Pittsburgh. And so both of my teachers, but especially my second teacher, Mr. Phillips, knew they were this, they, in fact, Phillips was older. And they knew him as this little brat, right. this little brat genius who used to come over to my teacher's house and play his compositions for him. And, and so he, he, he was a local uh, phenomenon. Even though him and Adam and um, Al Kozeman, yes. you know, they, they were really, you could see, just didn't like the guy. They don't like him. They don't like him. They didn't like him. So they were fishing, and they wanted to know, okay, right. what was going on? You know, tell me, tell me what's wrong with them. And I was like, um, well, let's see. I like worked with Leonard Bernstein. He was a genius. This is the same caliber. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to hear that. And it'll <laughs> so um, finally, I actually fished it out of them that he's not my kind of genius. Uh, right. Just like they decided he's not really American, although he's from Pittsburgh. He's not American enough. Right. That's funny. So, what, what about the collaborations with piano? I mean, you're going to play with 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 Baya, and you're going to play a piano quartet. Yes. Now, obviously, the, the the string quartet repertoire, every major quartet has had great collaborations. Yes. You've got, you mentioned Guarneri. Yes. Of course, with Rubinstein. Yes. Um, can you tell us about some of your more memorable co collaborations with pianists and and in a in a quartet, or maybe some ad hoc uh, piano quartets? Oh boy, there's got to be one. <laughs> well, there were there were the problem is there were a lot. That's right. There were a lot. One of the regular partners that we played with was, was the pianist Wu Han, actually from the Chinese Society Levin Center, and she's a, just a powerhouse, and not just in terms of her sound production, but also her general charisma and mm -hmm. and, and uh, energy and generosity. And so playing with Wu Han was always um, pretty extraordinary. I actually love playing. With Anne Marie McDermott. Do you know mm -hmm. Anne Marie? I've played with her. Yeah. You know how long I know Anne Marie? I, I will, I, she'll hate me for this, but I have known her since 1984. <laughs> so she was two. Well, yeah, she was two, and I was two. <laughs> two and a <Not>. half. Yeah. <laughs> She's actually a little older yeah. than I am. I, I found that so. I, I absolutely admire her energy, and we played a, we played a, a charity arrangement of the Mozart Concerto, the um, E minor, and boy. Yeah. We, yeah. You know, Annie and I mean, we would go back because of, uh, also when I got the job in the Philharmonic area for my house. So, oh, you know, I see. So all of my different sisters, you know, and I I'm old enough to remember Fame too. So it was, it was that it was Fame the movie. It was her company Carrie at the Tchaikovsky competition. Yes, that's right. And then you know New York, and then and then of course Vail. So uh, yeah, no. But of course, I've named three people, and I've left out twenty that were all extraordinary. Yeah. Well, it, it's amazing because uh, I think piano princess are maybe. Some of my favorite repertoire yeah. in, in the world, and, and and there are not that many of them. If you, you know, in the Baroque, obviously, it's, it's more of a secondary role. Right. So um, you know, it, it's it's just such great repertoire, and it gives everybody a chance to, especially this one. Well, as one often as as often as it's played, um, I still would say that my favorite, probably the most remarkable piece of chamber music that never grows tired for me is the Brahms. I, I've never grown tired. I've played it maybe 150 times at this yeah. point, and I just I find it as thrilling every time. You know, thrilling. it's funny you should mention that because it, it's so often that they, they program the Brahms and the yes. Dvorak for obvious reasons. Yes. And then if you're the second violinist, then 99 percent of the second violinists will tell you love playing the Dvorak. The Brahms have one phrase. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but it's a great but, it's, but that phrase, but that phrase in the, in the second movement. Yeah. If you're, I would say, if you take your job seriously as a second fiddle player. And you play it right, you can steal a whole show. Absolutely. Right. I just remembered, by the way, you were asking about piano collaborations. I remember playing the Dvorak once in Israel, uh, where the night before I had a lot to drink, and I mean a lot. And then the next, there was a concert the next morning at ten o'clock in the museum, the, the museum in, in um, Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And the first half was a Schubert octet, which I played first fiddle on that, and that's that's an hour long. Then intermission. Then the Borsha piano and I played second fiddle on that. And because I had so, so, so much to drink the night before, I had not slept, played the Schubert octet, um, the pianist took a very broad tempo and slowed it down. Very, very broad. And variations 
And unfortunately, uh, the last measure, I was so sleepy <laughs> that I went, I decided it's going to be a long note. So I put, started to play and I fell asleep. Oh my, I fell asleep while I was playing the last note. And I, I, she held it so long that I had enough time to briefly sleep, wake up in a terrible panic, and realize everyone was still holding the note. Oh. So they were clearly there. So you I made magic. magic. I made magic. I, but I did fall asleep in the concert playing the Borgia Pink. Wow. That is amazing. <laughs> I, I'm certain that you're not going to do that in this portion. I promise you. I promise you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think we, 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 we will be fine with this one. And, um, I'm also looking forward to the bridge playing second to you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and that'll be the October concert. Yes. So, in a way, this is almost like a mini festival for us, right? That's I mean, great. And we were talking before this before this recording, you know, you don't wear jackets. It's been a while since I wore jackets. I'm glad jacket. we fit in the yeah. same clothes, but still. Barely. My dry cleaner is about to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's using it. Oh, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to our collaboration. Pleasure. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you.